third talk. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So on my first lecture, I didn't quite have time to sketch out some details about a basic example of an attic space, which is the unit disk. So what I'm going to do is say, you know, we have our field CP that simplifies matters to work with it. And the attic unit disk over CP is spa CP angle brackets T, right? And what I did not have time to say is that the underlying topological space of this thing is a spectral space. Spa of a Huber pair is always a spectral space. What does that mean? It means exactly that it's homeomorphic to the spectrum of a ring, in particular, it's quasi-compact. And in this case, this uh, topological space happens to be connected. Now, we had also observed in the first lecture that this topological space contains the actual disk inside of CP circ, inside of the ring of integers, right? Each element here gives you a maximal ideal of this, and therefore an element in the, in the attic spectrum. So somehow, this has to be some big space which connects the unit disk inside of CP, which is totally disconnected, right? So here's how it does it. The way that it goes in my mind is that it's somehow a suspension of this CP circ, of this unit disk. And look, you've just got to study these. If you really want to study this in detail, you've got to study the five classes of points in this attic space. I've color-coded them, whatever. But this big point up here is a, called a Gauss point, and it's something, uh, yes, so it's like a a, a sup norm over the entire disk. You can take an element here and take its supremum norm on the entire uh, closed unit disk, and that corresponds to this guy. Of course, there are other disks out there, and you could take supremum norms, and those, those are these points of type 2. And there are points of other types. I just want to point out the classical points are in red, and they're all down here, right? And the Gauss points are in green, and they're all up here. And then those points are not closed. When you take the closure of one of these type 2 points, you get a type 5 point, which has rank 2. It's the sort of thing I was calling x plus or x minus on the first lecture. And these points in blue, I suppose, are the connective tissue that's holding this whole picture together. Okay, So it's a wonderful picture. I'm not going to go over it in detail. Nor, I suppose, is it strictly necessary to understand this picture, I guess, especially considering that for other higher dimensional spaces, the classification of points becomes impossible. You wouldn't want to do it. You can work with attic spaces without necessarily knowing what all of the points are. It's kind of liberating, right? The points just do whatever they have to do. Okay. Right. Although, I guess, oh, no, I know. The import, what's important? The important thing is it's spectral and it's actually, it's got um, crawl dimension two because you have a point up here that specializes to a point down here and that's the longest possible chain. So this is, yeah, that's important. So, um, no, sorry, dimension one. Oh, what did I just say? Dimension one, it's a disk, it's one dimensional. Okay. Um, variations. If I call this whole thing D, well, there's A1. You see, D is compact, but imagine D and just kind of blowing it off to infinity. And it becomes A1, so the attic A1 over, over CP. I suppose you can construct it as a limit of expanding Ds under multiplication by P map, right? So that just goes out to infinity. Um, it contains the classical points, which just be the entire field CP rather than just the disk inside of it. How would you start constructing that? Well, this green point up here, it's like an ion, and it has an extra room to bond another blue guy. <laughs> you would have to add another one. <laughs> you add another blue guy there, and then it can start branching out further and further along. Right? Okay. So D, so D lives inside of A1, it's attic space. CP, I want to emphasize the fact that this is an open subset. It's a rational subset of this attic space. Um, <laughs> What was the branching out thing? Imagine that this is like one of these guys down here. They can start branching up, out, up and out. Okay. <laughs> um, rather confusingly, even though this is the close, quote closed disk defined by t less than or equal to 1, it's open inside of A1. And so if you take its closure, you get something different. Great. 
So what would this closure be? We've got to close it. How do you close it? The closure is D union this one extra point. And that point is, uh, you know, it's rank two point. Okay. <laughs> and that would be if you just added a blue point right there. And that would be a closed subset of A1, okay? What else can we do? We have the D, the A1, the D bar, and you could even do P1. You can take the projective attic, attic line, and this would just be the A1 CP uh, union of point at infinity. Right? Okay. All right. Um, any questions on this picture? I mean, this, of course, you would construct this in the usual way. You would take, you can take two copies of A1 and you glue them together, right, at the non-zero points. Yes. Yeah, the question is, this extra point, this blue thing over here, is that the point that we threw out earlier? Absolutely. This D bar is what I was calling spa, um, well, it was what I was calling spa A++ before. This A++ is a slightly smaller ring where the coefficients of T and all of its powers have to have positive valuation. Okay. Other questions? Oh, oh, I can't, can anyone answer that question? What is the ring, if this is a spectral space, what is the ring that it is homeomorphic to the spectrum of, oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not a natural construction, it's not a um, canonical construction. Okay. Um, there are better ways to characterize spectral spaces than just they're homeomorphic to spectral. Uh, it's a bit out of my wheelhouse. How do you prove that it's, oh, how do you prove that it's a spectral space, that the spa of something is a spectral space? Well, there's an, the, you use the other characterization of spectral spaces that are inverse limit of sober T0 spaces, is that it? Okay. All right, so let's move on. Okay, this is just kind of cleaning up after my first lecture. Um, well, actually, there's one other thing. There's one other attic space I do want to talk about, which is, um, this is quite important, a formal open disk, okay. So uh, what if I did the following? I talked about various Huber pairs yesterday. And ZP double brackets T comma itself is an example of a Huber pair. The ring of definition is itself, and the ideal of definition has two generators. The generators are P and T, so this ring is P comma T attic, right? Let me call this thing X. And this is fibered over spa ZP, ZP, right? And we decided last time that this, the set of continuous valuations on ZP, there are two of them. There's a special point and there's a generic point, which I'll call eta. And it's important to be able to do things like take the generic fiber. In fact, in Anna's talk, this last talk, it was made reference to this process of taking a formal scheme and taking the generic fiber of it. Well, let's talk about that. It's lovely in the theory of attic spaces that taking the generic fiber is literally taking the fiber over a generic point. They're, you know, they're just taking the subset of X which lies over this eta. So what is this? Well, this is the set of all X and X such that, um, well, the set of valuations that don't think P is zero. And we said that whenever you have an element of a Huber ring, you can talk about an open subset of the spectrum, attic spectrum, consisting of those valuations that don't think that that element is zero. So here it is. And so this is fibered over just the single point eta. And what is that point eta? Well, it's, it's spa QP, spa QP ZP, which is just a single point. All right, so this is some attic space over QP. I could even write it as X QP. And what, uh, let's give some kind of description of it very quickly. So um, let's say X lies in this. Okay, so X is a valuation on this ring and it does not think that P is zero. It, um, what does it do with T? Well, T is a topologically nilpotent element. So it, powers of T have to approach zero and eventually they have to get less than this non-zero element. So if X belongs to the generic fiber, then there exists some large N such that um, X thinks that T to the N is less than or equal to P, right? That's what I'm getting at here. Because after all, this sequence has to go to zero. Okay. 
so great. So x belongs to some rational subset, the set of all x and x, such that um, such that this uh, these inequalities hold, and this is a rational subset of x, right? Um, I don't know if I ever introduced this notation, but this is how you would notate it. And uh, great, Th this is affinoid, and it's, uh, I can write it as spa of something. So there's a, a you know, when you define the structure sheaf of an, on an attic space, you have to say, what are the sections over a rational subset? So the sections over this rational subset, if you, there's some recipe for it, and you just take the original ring, and you should adjoin this fraction, and then you should maybe complete. <laughs> and then the thing which is not zero, you should invert it. Okay, well, that's, that's what the recipe says to do. But then you should clear some brush and re reorganize this. This is this ring. Oh, and then there's a second thing that I'm not going to bother writing. It's, it's just the bounded elements here. So, um, so what, what, what is this ring? We've taken power series ring. We've adjoined an extra element. We've piadically completed. And we've inverted P. What have we actually done? So this is just the set of power series. With uh, QP coefficients, um, such that this converges on the domain where t is less than or equal to p to the 1 over n. That's it. Which transforms into some condition about a n's, whatever it is. OK. So, uh, so x belongs to this. And great, bravo. Now we have x living in some um, affinoid uh, attic space. And these guys are going to cover the whole thing. So x eta is a union, as n goes to 1 to infinity, of this rational subset, like so. So we've covered x eta by rational subsets. x eta is not quasi-compact. There's no refinement of this to a finite covering. I mean, you're taking this to be the closed disk of radius what? p to the 1 over n? OK, as n goes to infinity, that stretches out towards the, o the boundary of the open disk. So you can really think of eta, x eta as some kind of open disk and you're covering it with these growing closed disks like this. So this is reaching out towards the boundary. How you want to reconcile this picture with this picture <laughs> exercise for the reader, I guess. Okay. Um, good. Oh, yes. Yeah, so it's not quasi-compact. <coughs> and I suppose one more thing. Maybe you're interested in knowing what the global sections of the structure sheaf are. What are the functions on this whole space? Hey, given any scheme, you can ask what the global functions are. And given any attic space, you can ask the same question. So in this case, it's like, well, what are all of the functions which are well-defined in all of these? You can write it as an inverse limit over, rings, over the rings that are like this. But more prosaically, you want just the functions that converge on the open unit disk. And in fact, this is all you get. It's just a power series like so, with QP coefficients and convergent on t less than 1, okay. which is a ring. It's a perfectly good ring. It contains, it contains elements, though, where the denominators are unbounded, you know, like a logarithm map might have coefficients that actually go to infinity, but it nonetheless converges on the open unit disk. That's fine. Um, but, you know, because you can't really generate everything with bounded guys, this is not a Huber ring. This is not a Huber ring. It is rather um, what's known as a Frechet algebra. Oh. There's a family of norms on this. They come from each of the norms on these rational subsets. And the family of norms generates a topology. And this is complete with respect to that family. That's a Frechet algebra. Any questions on that before I move on to perfectoidy stuff? Okay. So the genetic type is therefore not spectral. The generic fiber is therefore not spectral because it fails to be quasi-compact. It is, however, locally spectral, like every attic space is. Okay. Others? Great. Okay. Well. 
Well, let's dive right back in. So from last time, I had made this definition of uh, something I called H, which is a formal multiplicative group. And what, what is that? So How about this? Does that work? Do I look weird? I think so. <laughs> okay. So this, I'm going to consider this as a functor for now. From from complete Huber pairs R R plus to um, Z P modules. And what is this going to do? So R, R plus gets sent to what? Okay, so it's going to be the formal multiplicative group. So it should be the group of elements close to one under multiplication. So this is going to be one. And I'm going to write it this way. R with this double circ symbol. That means topologically nilpotent elements. And this is a group under multiplication. So elements which are close to one in the sense that the difference from one is topologically nilpotent. Why have I done that? Well, in the end, I do want a ZP module. I want to be able to take an element here and raise it to a p-adic number. And, to, and when you do that, the, you know, the binomial series, series, that needs to converge. And in order for that to converge, this should be topologically nilpotent. Okay. okay. Um, so the thing with this is that this H isn't just some functor, it's representable. It's representable by a formal scheme. So in the world of attic spaces, I can just say that H is representable. It's, uh, what is it representable by? Well, this one is just a red herring. What represents the functor that takes R to R double zero? It's going to be a power series ring. And I didn't say what basis was over. It's over ZP. Right. So why do I say that H is representable this way? Well, if I try to take the points of this over spa RR plus, that's like homomorphisms from this pair to this pair. Um, so there's some redundancy here. Maps from this pair to this pair, that's just maps from Z to B double brackets T to R plus in the category of topological rings. And these have to, over ZP. And so T has to go to something topologically no potent in R plus, and that's all it has to do. So it has to land both in R plus and topologically no potent elements. However, if you are topologically no potent, then powers of U get closer and closer to zero. Eventually they have to enter R plus because R plus is open by design. And so if you're in R double zero, you just have to be in R plus automatically. Great. So that's why this H, that's why this, this definition of H represents the right thing. Okay. So this is a formal scheme, and it's a ZP module object in the category of formal schemes. If I like, I can go ahead and take the generic fiber. This is a ZP module object in the category of um, attic spaces over QP. I just went over how to take the generic fiber of something which looks just like this. So the underlying um, attic space is the open attic disk over QP. And I've just given it the structure of a ZP module. Great. Now, well, this is of course about perfectoid spaces, so one of them has to come eventually. But what I'm going to do is something that's literally what Anna did in the last hour which is to take a limit of a sequence of maps of this formal scheme. So what I'm going to do is let H tilde be the limit 
of you know, each object and the inverse system is just h, and the transition maps are multiplication by p. Although we have to remember this is the multiplicative group, so multiplication by p is like raising to the power of p. Now, what does raising to the power of p do modulo p? It raises to the power of p. So this is rather, so, on, this, so on, honest theorem definitely applies to this. So the generic fiber of this H tilde should definitely be a perfectoid space once I introduce a perfectoid base. So this is, um, this is sometimes called the universal cover. And um, so let me just demonstrate what happens when I take the R points of this guy. So the R points of this H tilde, well, hey, it doesn't depend on R plus at all. There's this notion, by the way, of partial properness that means maps from spa R plus into it, it doesn't, the R plus just doesn't matter. And that has something to do with the lack of a boundary. So somehow this open disk, it doesn't have a boundary. Anyway, um, R plus doesn't matter in this case. So this limit under the map X goes to X to the P, right? Well, I'm going to play a certain game here that's going to be familiar from the last lecture. So I map this to the limit, same transition map, of um, 1 plus R double zero modulo P. I just reduce mod P, reduce the whole picture mod P. And when I do this, um, it's one of these things where a priori it looks like a lossy procedure, but actually it's an isomorphism. This is an isomorphism of... Oh, QP vector spaces, actually. Oh, I didn't say this. This is a QP vector space. You can do this to any old ZP module you like. You can apply this limit process. What comes out is a QP vector space. Okay. Um, right. So the thing, this, and this is something like a tilt, and somehow the tilt alternates between characteristic zero and P, and this is exactly what's happening here. Um, this one plus is just a red herring, and if I just remove it and forget about the group structure, then there's a bijection there, and then finally there's just a bijection here. All of the transition maps are raising to the power of P. Okay. So uh, what have I done here? I've shown that this H tilde is um, representable also. So uh, the underlying um, attic space of this H tilde is supposed to represent the functor, which assigns to an R the inverse limit under raising to the power of P of this R double circ. Okay, let's think. What represents that functor? The thing that represents it is ZP double brackets T, but T just gives you the first variable here. You have to take a arbitrary piece powers of it and take power series in that. And you can see why, oh, and I have to do it again. And you can see why maps from this ring that I'm writing down right now into R is exactly this. Because the image of T lives there, and the image of T to the 1 over P is a P root, and so forth. Okay. So this H tilde is representable also by a, a formal scheme that looks like this. And then I can go ahead and take a generic fiber if I like. So it's the same process. I'm going to set P to not equal zero, and then I get an attic space when I do that. Um, to get a perfectoid space, though, I do have to base change to some perfectoid field. So, so for any perfectoid field, K, the base change, H tilde K, is a perfectoid space. Oh, goodness, yeah, I never actually, did I ever actually define what this thing is? I'll define it now. Well, I'm going to say that it's PTiatically complete. So yeah, the topology is generated by two elements, P and T. If you like, this is the P comma T attic completion of Z adjoin T one over P infinity, and that's important. I leave it to you to figure out how you would present actual elements of this ring. It's slightly complicated. Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. Well, what do we have here? We have a perfectoid space 
but it's also a QP vector space, and that's kind of going to be the theme going forward. So unlike in Anna's course, where she's presenting a very complicated perfectoid space, a modular curve at infinite level, the perfectoid spaces here will be simple. They'll be kind of just QP vector spaces. They're in the world of linear algebra, and we know how to do linear algebra. All right, well, what am I about to do with these things? So from last time, what do we do? We found that, um, oh yeah, let's say C is a algebraically closed perfectoid field. So C lives in characteristic P now, and it's algebraically closed. And if I were to take H tilde of C circ, so that's everything close to C0 under multiplication, but then I take this inverse limit. You've noticed, you know, I've written this H tilde here, but actually it doesn't quite matter. Because C is perfect, multiplication by P is an automorphism, so this tilde doesn't actually do anything. But for psychological reasons, I like working with the perfectoid space in this context, so I'm just going to stick with H tilde. All right. We discovered that H tilde of C circ modulo ZP star, this funny quotient. So this is a QP vector space, and we're modding out by the action of ZP star. This classifies untilts, untilts of C. That's what we discovered last time. So that's quite interesting and important, it seems. So untilts of a perfectoid field in characteristic P, if it's algebraically closed, are classified by some QP vector space modulo ZP star. So what is this QP vector space? How big is it? What's its dimension? Well, its dimension over QP, if you look at it like this, so this is, remember, 1 plus MC. Um, it's huge. It's definitely uncountable over QP. But what's funny about it is that you can present it in such a way where it doesn't seem quite so big. You see, here's what I'm going to do. I have H of C. If I do have some untilt, If I do H of the untilt, like so, so this is just the same as H tilde of the tilt, just by, well, the very definition of the tilt. This is an inverse limit along um, elements. No, I put the tilt in the wrong. Sorry, I put the tilde. I forgot the tilde. Um, this tilde indicates that I'm taking an inverse limit over Frobenius, and that's just like a tilt. That just tilts this sharp, and you get back to C again. See, I said that C sharp was an untilt of C. So this should be true. So I might as well work over some untilt. OK, fine. And then what is this? So H tilde of C sharp circ. So that's every, that's this um, limit. Well, I, you know, if I, if I ignore the, this tilde, then I can think about this guy in terms of, you know, it has a logarithm map. This is just everything, this is just the you open unit disk of radius 1 around 1. And for such an element, I can take a logarithm of it. And then it lands in C. And this is uh, surjective. It lands in C sharp. And it's surjective because C sharp is algebraically closed. Uh, no, that's not the reason. Hold on, hold that thought. Um, What's the kernel of this? Well, which elements have log equal to zero? Just the roots of unity. And those are all in C-sharp because it's algebraically closed. So. OK, so we have an exact sequence of ZP modules like this. Okay. What I do now is I apply, I turn uh, I turn the h into an h tilde, and how do I do that? I apply an inverse limit along multiplication by p max. So the log is surjective because you have Yeah, yeah. You don't need any um, hypothesis on this. So the reason, yeah, um, this is a map of ZP modules. If you want something to be in the image, um, oh, no, you do need C to be algebraic. Here's what you do. You multiply it by a sufficiently high power of p to get it close to the origin. <coughs> then you apply the exponential map to get it into here. But then to get that it's the right thing, then you have to take a p to the nth root. And for that, you need it to be algebraically closed. So you do need to be algebraically closed. My gut was right. So. 
All right, you apply the inverse limit along multiplication by p in this sequence of zp modules. So this, this mu p infinity becomes a Tate twist, a qp1, this is a qp vector space of dimension one. In the middle, it's h tilde of c sharp circ, which is the same as h tilde of c circ, the object that we're interested in, the same object that appears here in the untilts, the thing we care about. And this maps to, well, Multiplication by p is an automorphism here, so nothing happens. Great. So this is a good kind of presentation for what this QP vector space is. This is an exact sequence of QP vector spaces. So this huge QP vector space is an extension of a C-sharp vector space by a one-dimensional QP vector space. It's very, very strange. And actually, you get such a presentation for every single untelt you pick. This is a strange phenomenon, and it happens a lot, so let's get used to it. So um, this h tilde thing is an extension of a C-sharp vector space by a QP vector space. So Colmez initiated a study of these guys, and he called them, he called this thing, anyway, a Banach space, Espace de Banach, but with capital letters, indicating that it's strange. Or, or big or something, I don't, of dimension. And the dimension is a pair, and the pair is 1, 1, indicating that it's got a dimension as a C-sharp vector space and a dimension as a QP vector space. It's an amalgamation of the two. Okay. Wonderful. So there are all sorts of variations on this, um, but I wanted, you to, I wanted to expose you to one of them right now. Okay. If you look at the notes, you can do this with other sorts of formal groups. When, did I, when do I end? 4.30? What is it? I have no idea. It's an open question. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. 4, 4.35, okay. All right, well... I've given you some practice with taking an attic space and taking its generic fiber, and I want to do something kind of similar that's going to be relevant to our study of untilts of a given perfectoid field of characteristic P. And so this goes under the heading of the Farg-Fontaine curve. Okay, so let's keep this assumption that C is a characteristic P, algebraically closed, perfectoid field. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so we, we, we realize that um, on tilts of C, these corresponded to various things we've already seen. One of those things were, um, oh, not elements, but ideals of the form, well, principal ideals, inside of uh, the ring of Witt vectors, uh, I'll write it the way I usually do, C circ, um, where this element psi is a primitive of degree one. Okay, so some ideals inside of W of C circ, yeah. Um, we can cast all this stuff another way. I mean, we realize that for every No, oh, I should say of characteristic zero. Whenever we have C sharp and untilt of C, we learned that there's this theta map, which I called theta C sharp. And this goes from W of C circ over to C. And um, so this takes a Teichmuller element and it sends it to X sharp. Whenever X lives here, there's a sharp here. Yeah. And since C sharp is in characteristic zero, so P is invertible in it. And if I let um, pi be a pseudo uniformizer, then the image of the Teichmuller representative of that pseudo uniformizer is also invertible. So this theta map actually factors through this, this quotient here. Okay. So bo both of these elements land in invertible elements of C sharp, so I can say this. Okay, 
So this, this prompts, I hope, the following definition. And this is called the attic fart Fontaine curve. So it's written with a script Y, and it depends on C, our chosen algebraically closed perfectoid field and characteristic P. And it's going to be, um, well, being an attic space, I need a Huber pair, and that Huber pair is going to be just built out of the vit vectors of C circ. Okay. Well, I can certainly do that, but um, I want to limit it by basically inverting these two elements. So I'm going to throw away those points that think that um, p and pi are 0, right? And so somehow points here should vaguely correspond to quotients of this guy. And yeah, yeah. Uh, in particular, I mean, untilt C sharp for every untilt here, you do get such a homomorphism. And so you can take the valuation on C sharp and pull it back to W of C tilt, W of C, sorry. And that gives you a point here. And that valuation doesn't think that P or pi is zero. So you do get a point here. Yes? Here? Yeah, I, yeah. So, I mean, the concise way of writing it is like this. And maybe I've written similar things enough for you to understand what this means. You throw away the valuations that think this element is zero. Just like in an algebraic geometry setting, if I wrote something like this, you would say, throw away the prime ideals which contain that element. Okay, so certainly untilts land, you get, you get a map like this. There's certainly a map from untilts of C sharp into the underlying topological space YC to characteristic zero, right? Because each time you have an element, an untilt C sharp, you have this homomorphism. You can pull back the valuation on C sharp to get a continuous valuation on the vit ring. <laughs> That valuation does not think that either of these elements are zero. So yes, you get a map like this. And this is starting to suggest that um, the set of untilts of C-sharp uh, really does have some geometric content. Maybe this attic space has something to do with it. Okay. So I'll quote one theorem due to, due to Quran, which is that, um, well, I cheated a little bit. Um, you're not supposed to be able to do these things unless you know that a Huber pair is Shifi. Is this Shifi? I don't know. But when you remove this part, it certainly becomes Shifi. In fact, it becomes a Ethereum, locally an Ethereum. So I'll just say this. The theorem is that this is a, an attic space. There are no problems that arise from not being Shifi. Okay. And if you wanted to, you could take a page from what I did with the open attic disk to give a covering of this space by affinoid attic spaces that are sort of like, well, I don't know, you just have to write them down. They're derived from this vit ring in certain ways. Okay. And one more thing. So this C is a perfect, perfect field of characteristic P, so it certainly has a Frobenius automorphism, and that doesn't change this condition. So the whole thing, YC, has an action of a Frobenius map, phi, on C. Um, I can do various things at this point. I can certainly define, as I did before, the set of global sections of the structure sheaf of this YC. Like so. Um, I wanted to draw an analogy between this and the Frechet algebra of power series conversion on the open unit disk. It's not Huber, but it has a collection of valuations with respect to which it is complete. So this is another Frechet algebra, and it carries an action of phi. Okay. All right, so this BC was a subject of intense study by Farg and Fontaine. Well, all right, what do we do with these things? Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, um, let's talk about those things which are supposed to represent untilts. I said before that the object which um, parametrizes untilts is the quotient of this h tilde of c circ. Okay. Give it an element here, I get an untilt. Um, so let's explore that a little bit more in depth. Uh, if I have an element here, so all this is, it's an element of, you know, just to remind you, this is really nothing but an element of the maximal ideal of C plus one. It's something close to one inside of the perfectoid field C. Well, what I can do is um, take the Teichmuller representative and, well, that lives in H of the Wittring. It's um, close to one in a sense, although you have to be careful. This ring is topologized with not just the p-adic topology, but the topology coming from both p and pi. In that sense, it's close to one there, so it gets to be a part of this, this group. So uh, what happens when I take this epsilon and I apply the Frobenius to it? Well, the way that Frobenius works, so the, I'm allowed to apply it, first of all, because all of these constructions are functorial on their arguments. And uh, when Frobenius works its way inside of a, this pair of brackets, it just raises to the power of p. Uh, but this bracket thing is a homomorphism of multiplicative monoids, so it's just the same as raising to a power of p. Okay, <laughs> so what I do now is um, I'm going to do something funny. I'm going to take the logarithm of this element, which means uh, literally do this. Okay, so actually this, this may remind you of the construction I did before. Um, this is similar to what I did to construct the element xi. I wanted to construct an element xi such that theta of it was zero. I wanted to construct a primitive element of degree one, which lies in the kernel of the theta map, um, because theta took epsilon to one, and I wanted an element that takes it to zero. And so how do I turn one into zero? I take a logarithm. So somehow this is a very natural construction for what, 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 wants, what I want to do. So let's take logarithm here. Except where does this converge? Unfortunately, this does not converge inside of W of C circ because there are denominators. So these denominators will eventually accrue powers of P. Meanwhile, though, the numerator is going to zero fairly quickly. So actually, this is going to converge on the whole of YC. This is going to be an element of the ring B of global sections on the farg fontaine curve. So this element has a name. It is called T. If you have ever studied uh, any kind of piatic hodge theory, the element T may look familiar. If you haven't, then this T, I'm sure, looks horribly unfamiliar. So you know, where did this come from? Well, what happens when we take T and we apply the element, apply the operator phi to it? Well, we get the same as when we apply this thing, but that's the same as log of epsilon to the p, but that's the same as p times t. Great. So t lives in the part of bc where phi acts as p. <coughs> Wonderful. Uh, another neat thing, it's actually quite easy to write down elements of bc phi equals p. Here, let's take an element x in C double zero, an element in the maximal ideal of C, or say zero. And I can write down a series which visibly converges to an element where phi acts as P. I kind of do what I have to do. I take x, and then if x is going to be there, I need to make sure that x to the P over P is going to be there, so that that works, and then x to the P squared over p squared will be there, and, but then I also need to write p and then x to the one over p. That's okay because this is a perfect ring. I can do this. Oh, and I can actually write down this double-tailed series. It's wonderful. 
It's like a Laurent series in P, but it's a double-tailed Laurent series in P. <coughs> this converges in the ring BC. I had to kind of puncture it in two places. I had to puncture it, I had to say P is not equal to zero, and that, that, that assures that I can do this side of the series. And then I had to, uh, and then this side of the series is fine because what's going on in the representatives are bounded, but I'm multiplying them by higher powers of P. So convergence is no problem. And then if you apply phi to this element, that just raises each x to the power of P, and then a, a multiple of P just comes out. It's great. So actually every element of BC phi equals P looks like this, and you can add two of these elements and get another element of the same form. It's kind of neat. So where is this all headed? Theorem, and this is due to Farg and Fontaine. It gives yet another interpretation of H tilde of C cert, this thing that we know parametrizes untilts. So what have I done? At the beginning, I said, let epsilon be in this set, and then I constructed an element T, which lies here. So this is a QP vector space isomorphism. So far, so good. I guess I can add one more point. This thing parametrizes untilts, so what's the interaction of this picture with that? If C-sharp is an untilt to characteristic zero, well, the thing is, you know we have this theta map, theta C-sharp, from W of C circ to C sharp. Well, this extends to BC, it turns out. Actually, this is pretty easy to see. I mean, uh, it, it, you just have to show that whatever converges in BC, when you apply theta to the terms of that series, it converges in C sharp as well. So, uh, yeah, I've got this map from BC to C sharp. Fine, that's the theta map. Uh, this was already surjective once you invert P, and P is invertible here, so that's, yeah. Um, what's the kernel of this theta map? Well, it's T, it's generated by this element T. <laughs> so the kernel is just like so. So this BC thing, oh, sorry, I have to put phi equals P in order for this to be an exact sequence. Um, the theorem tells me I have an isomorphism like so. And I already wrote down an exact sequence which looks like this. Great. This presentation, in terms of these x's, is an amusing side point. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, this, is, this has more content. Um, so this interpretation of H tilde, okay, it lives, it's this kind of hybrid QP vector space between a C-sharp vector space and a QP vector space. Kind of has an interpretation in terms of some of the elements of piatic Hodge theory. There's this, the phi equals P part of this, this kind of period ring here, and yeah, like so. Okay. Oh. oh, where's BDR, right? So BDR I wasn't going to present in this lecture, but BDR appears as a completion of the Vit ring with respect to the kernel of the theta map. And T certainly represents an element of that completion. Yeah, this, C, this theta... This data vanishes on all of these things, so it, uh, so it converges in, in that. Yeah, so this is all, just the same in element of B-Duron. Okay. A variation. All right, I'm going to change the value of H now. So I'm going to let... Um, 
Um, yeah, instead of h, it'll be h d over h. Okay. So let's suppose d and h are uh, relatively prime. And suppose that d is less than or equal to h. And I'm going to let h, d over h, be a formal group of height h and dimension d over zp, say, or some finite extension thereof. It doesn't really matter. Well, you can always come up with these things for any choices of d and h, um, but where might one come from? Well, you can take in a super singular elliptic curve, or that is an elliptic curve over zp with super singular reduction, and uh, you can take its completion oops, at its origin. You know, you can talk about the formal group of an elliptic curve, just like in Silverman's textbook. Uh, when you do this to this super singular elliptic curve, you get something of height 2 and dimension 1, of course, since the elliptic curve is. Uh, so you get an h 1 half when you do this. All right. Well, I'm going to go through the litany of things here. h d over h, um, it's a formal scheme. And if it's dimension d, then it's a formal scheme in d variables. Okay. And you can consider its universal cover. You can take the same inverse limit over multiplication by p maps. And surprise, surprise, you're just going to get the same thing, but with take all of these variables to the 1 over p infinity. The idea being that modulo p, multiplication by p, is something like raising these variables to some power of p. When you take the generic fiber of this formal scheme over any perfectoid field, you get a perfectoid space. So this is a QP vector space object in the category of perfectoid spaces. Um, what is it? So uh, in the same context as before, if I look at the C points of this guy, I can ask, OK, this is some huge QP vector space. What does it look like? Well, it's going to be an extension of one vector space by another. If I have an untilt, I'll call it C sharp then it's going to map onto d copies of the C-sharp. And the kernel will be a vector space over QP of dimension H. This is like the rational Tate module, and this is the Lie algebra. Okay. Um, great. <laughs> I can even say more. Um, there's an isomorphism along the lines of Farg and Fontaine. In fact, they proved this as well. This is isomorphic to the period ring BC, <laughs> the part where phi to the H equals P to the D. This is mapped via theta C sharp. Oh, well, there's more. Well, there's a little more to it than this. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just stop there. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Questions for Jared? Does the little h not come into effect when you're looking at h d over h as a formal scheme? Or? Does the little h, ah, right, like over here. Does the little, no, it doesn't, because the underlying formal scheme, ignoring the, the zp action, sorry, ignoring the group structure, only sees the dimension. It's like saying the underlying formal scheme of the elliptic curve after you complete it at the origin, that doesn't know whether it's ordinary or super singular. Only the group operation, when you multiply by p and look what that does, tells you what the height is. So here we're seeing some geometric structure. Um, 
a associated to untilts of a perfectoid field. Are there any other uh, perfectoid rings or spaces that have sort of interesting geometric structure on their family of untilts? Oh, uh, the question is like, are there any other geometric objects that have an interesting moduli space of untilts? Sure, you can relativize everything. So we, I just defined for you an attic space attached to a perfectoid field C, but you can also define the same attic space attached to a perfectoid ring R perfectly well. So this whole thing works in families. Yeah. Are there higher dimensional analogs of farg fontaine curves? Are there higher dimensional analogs of farg fontaine curves? You can, may, maybe. Um, I mean, you can, yeah, they wouldn't be curves. You can, well, yeah. No, that's a glib answer, I'm sorry. But you can, um, yeah, I'm inclined to say yes. Um, I'm inclined to say yes, you can take products of SPA QP together in, in an appropriate sense. In some strange way, uh, this, this curve is actually a product of QP by itself in a funny way. And so you could keep on going with that. Oh, okay. Something like, okay, just wait for Quran's last lecture. It'll be great. Okay. All right. Well, let's thank Jared again. <laughs> See you at the evening sessions.